Okay, hi there, welcome to a macro video. We're going to revise uh, different measures of national income and how it relates to a country's economic growth. The first thing to think about is the difference between nominal versus real GDP. GDP, of course, stands for gross domestic product, and that measures the total value of the national output of goods and services produced in a given time period, and crucially, it's the value of the output of goods and services uh, supplied, produced within the geographical borders of a country. Now, nominal or money GDP is the value of output at today's prices, at current prices. If I go to the supermarket and buy a meal deal for, let's say, £4, sandwich, some crisps and a, and a can of Coke or something for £4, that is the value of spending at today's prices. It's not adjusted for inflation. Whereas real GDP does adjust the level of spending and output and income using a consumer price index. And that means if you get the data in real terms, the effects of inflation have been considered. And it's normally seen as a better guide to changes in the volume or the quantity of goods and services that have been produced. Now, in exams, you will need to know how to calculate real GDP from the data given. So here's a, a quick example. Consider the money value of a country's GDP to be $4,000 million or $4 billion in 2020. Now, in 2021, the value of GDP goes up to 4500 Quite a significant increase. But over the year, there's also been some inflation. We're going to assume an inflation of 3%. So that causes the general index or the general price level to go up from 100, the base year value in 2020, to 103. So then how do we calculate real GDP? Well, you could always have a go, of course, uh, if you want to press the pause button, have a go, and then check through the answer with me in a second or two. So the value of real GDP in 2021 is calculated thus. It's the money value of GDP in 2021, which we know to be $4,500 million dollars multiplied by 100 divided by the price index for that year. We've had 3% inflation, so the index goes up to 103. And if you do the maths, think you get the answer of $4,369 million. And uh, instead of that being at current prices, that's measured at constant 2020 prices. So real GDP is inflation adjusted data. This chart actually is quite handy, quite useful. It shows both GDP in real terms in blue and GDP in nominal money terms in orange. And you can see that real GDP grows less quickly or more slowly than nominal GDP because, of course, we're taking inflation into account. We're deflating the data uh, because of uh, price inflation. So nominal data gives monetary values also known as money GDP, not inflation adjusted, expressed at current prices, today's prices, whereas real GDP is adjusted for inflation. We, uh, we hold prices at the level of a chosen base year, and therefore the GDP data in real terms is expressed at constant prices. And real GDP can then be used as a measure of economic growth. Here's the data, here's the annual growth of GDP in real terms for the UK from 1949 all the way through to 2020. So effectively, during the 70 year worth of data, you can see the economic cycles. Uh, you can see the times when the UK went into recession. But crucially, that you can see the depth of the impact of the pandemic on real GDP for the UK. Just looking at the last uh, 10 or 12 years, 2009, of course, was the year of recession after the global financial crisis. Then a decade or so of slow but positive growth. And then uh, a loss of 10% of GDP in the UK in 2020, with a, with a fairly you know, sharp recovery expected, of course, there's a lot of uncertainty as to how 2021 will turn out. Another measure of national output or national income you need to be aware of for most exam boards is gross national income or GNI. And that measures the final value of incomes flowing to in our case, UK-owned factors of production, regardless of whether they're in the UK or, or overseas. And GDP equals, so GNI, gross national income, equals GDP plus net property income from overseas. So that is 
primary income, property income from things like uh, interest on savings, profits from the profits of companies located overseas, uh, dividends and uh, things like rental income. So it's basically investment income from the assets that a country's nationals earn overseas. And GNI is now widely regarded as the best indicator of a country's living standards, uh, although it doesn't technically record transfers such as remittance incomes. And here's a good example of a country, Hong Kong, whose GNI is actually bigger than their GDP. Uh, there's the figures for GDP, um, gross national income of Hong Kong. That's in Hong Kong dollars. I think the Hong Kong dollar is fixed against the US dollar at about eight and a half dollars to the Hong, uh, Hong Kong dollars to the US dollar. So divide by about eight to get the US figure. Uh, but Hong Kong is a, a, a high gross national income. It's a high income country, in part because there's a big net inflow of property income from their overseas investments. Another little tweak you need to do when you get the data, of course, is to measure things in per capita terms. Per capita income, of course, is just simply the level of GDP divided by a country's resident population. And here's the data for 2020. These are the countries in the world with the highest GDP in dollars per capita, Luxembourg and Switzerland right up there, along with Ireland. Ireland is now one of the richest countries in the European Union. Uh, those are countries that's per capita GDP. Here's another way of expressing some data. This is GDP per, de per capita in the UK. Uh, and then we divide it, we subdivide it by region. Quite interesting there, you can see London way out ahead in terms of its per capita incomes. Um, but then there's a whole clutch of countries with a per capita income of less than £30,000 per year. Indeed, per capita income in the North East, according to this measure, is um, under half, under half the figure for London and only about, uh, what, 65, 70% of the figure for the UK as a whole. So there are quite big regional variations in per capita income. However, the other one which we need to think about in revision is the concept of measuring regional, national GNI or GDP data at purchasing power parity or PPP. So let's just finish off by thinking about this for a moment or two. PPP stands for purchasing power parity and it's basically a measure of uh, how many units of one country, uh, country's currency are needed to buy the same basket of goods and services as can be bought with a given amount of another currency. So for example, it's essentially saying that what will $1,000 buy you in Hong Kong? What will $1,000 buy you in South Africa um, with, the, with the land as their currency? What will $1,000 buy you in London compared with perhaps Glasgow? Uh, purchasing power parity is the idea that items should more or less cost the same in different countries based on the exchange rate at the time. But of course they don't um, because exchange rates are rarely at their PPP level. In some countries, for example, the cost of living is very high. Think about countries such as Norway or Denmark or Sweden or Switzerland, where relative living costs are much higher and $1,000 probably won't buy you anything like the same quantity of goods and services that you could buy in countries such as, for example, India or South Africa or I don't know, Vietnam, for example. So international data on national income is often subject to a PPP adjustment. And here's some data for 2019, I think, expressed at constant 2017 prices. It's in US dollars and it's PPP adjusted. You can see this is the size of an economy. So Luxembourg has a very, very high GDP per capita. But of course, it's a tiny economy compared to the United States, the UK, Germany and other countries. And here's a way of expressing the, the living standards in terms of GDP per capita in real terms. Again, in US dollars, but adjusted for PPP. So Norwegian GDP per capita, 63,633 US dollars. If they didn't make a PPP adjustment, of course, that figure would be higher because Norwegian living costs are noticeably higher than, than the United States, for example. Uh, just a really good example of this. Uh, India has a conversion factor for PPP of approximately 0.3, might even be a little bit less than that. Well, what does this mean? It means that if you take the GDP per capita of India in nominal terms, uh, it's about just over $2,000, uh, $2,200 at current prices. But when you make a PPP adjustment, your conversion factor, you divide by around 0.3, but a bit less than that, in fact, 
and that means that GDP per capita for India, PPP, the latest figures I have, over seven thousand uh, dollars per capita. There, so you can see the impact of the PPP adjustment uh, for India. And you normally take the United States Consumer Price Index or General Price Level as your benchmark or your basis for the calculation. Now, you won't have to calculate PPP stuff in the exam, but you do need to be aware of what it means and how perhaps you can interpret the data. So it's well worth practicing and having a look, having a look at uh, some data response questions. Well, there we go. There was a quick video on different measures of national income and growth. Thanks for joining in as always. We always appreciate it. Take care, stay safe and see you again sometime soon.